Okay, in this video we will uh, look at the generalization of the results that we uh, proved last time. So let me show you what we did last time. Um, yeah, here. So we were looking at uh, this Feynman diagram where P is the momentum that enters into this. This is the external momentum. Okay, where could P could be um, uh, time-like or um, a space-like momentum. We leave it um, a general for now. So this is the integral that we were looking at in four dimensions. Okay, so you are still in four dimensions, but then we saw that this integral is divergent in four dimensions. It is ultraviolet divergent, and it diverges diverges logarithmically. And to uh, avoid that complication, we said, okay, we will look at this integral in two dimensions where this integral will uh, converge, okay? And that we could see by power counting. So that is why you have D2L here, okay? The propagators are the same, but we are working in lower dimensions. Then we use Feynman parameterization, okay? And we did some shifting of momenta and then we looked at the external momentum. Uh, we looked at the, the case where external momentum is space-like. Okay, and, and in that case, we saw that we could rotate the contour axis, the con integration contour to the, uh, to the imaginary axis. Okay, and that is called weak rotation. And then we could uh, find the integral. There were no singularities. Okay, this is the denominator here in the integral, we found that it, it was positive definite. So there were no singularities on the on the integration contour of uh, K2. Okay, if you are doing an integral over K2. Okay, and then we uh, found the, the results for um, physical momenta where P square is time-like by analytic continuation. Okay, that's what we found here. And now what we want to see is that the same procedure goes through even when you are looking at Feynman diagrams which are having more than one loop. Okay, so uh, as, I, as you know that Green's functions, um, the analytic structure of Green's function is going to be given by, the, by these integrals, the remaining overall factors and other things that sit in the numerator doesn't uh, bother us. So we'll not worry about those things and we will only worry about the Feynman integrals. So let's proceed with that. I'll draw one um, diagram to give you some idea of kind of denominators that we are going to get in these integrals. So, and I'm drawing it in phi cube theory. Okay. It doesn't matter we, because we are not looking at um, at the vortices and other things anyway. So you could do the same thing in 5-4 theory, similar diagrams and arrive at the same conclusion. So let's say that P1, P2 and P3 are the external momenta. Okay, so they let's say P1 square is M1 square, P2 square is M2 square, P3 square is M3 square, or you could take all of them to be equal, does not matter. It doesn't change our argument. Okay, so this is a diagram of how many loops? This is a two loop diagram. Okay. And let's do a, some assignment of momenta. So I will put a loop momentum L1 to be flowing in this direction. You don't have to put it this way, you can put it differently. There are many ways in which you can assign momenta, but this is one particular choice of momentum assignment. Okay, and as you are already aware, that result does not depend on how you assign these loop momenta. Okay, so that's L1. At this vertex, P1 and L1 are entering. So what should be flowing here is L1 plus P1, okay? Then at this vertex, P2 is injected. Then what should be here is 
L1 plus P1 plus P2. Now here the momentum what flows in here is undetermined because I do not know what is coming from here and that I don't know because this is a two loop diagram and you will need two, um, two loop momenta. They are undetermined. They have to be integrated over. So you need one more uh, loop momentum and let me assign L2 to be flowing in this direction. Okay, then this one gets fixed. It is L1 plus L2 plus P1 plus P2. Okay. Okay, I want to change the direction of this one. I will put it this way. Okay. Does not matter. You can take it in also, but I'm going to take it out. Then you have this momentum L1 plus L2 plus P1 plus P2 entering here and at, at this vertex. P3 is taken out. So what flows in here is L1 plus L2 plus P1 plus P2 minus P3. Okay. You could have drawn this differently and I mean not drawn but momentum assignment could have been different. So if you took L2 to be going upwards instead of coming downwards, then this L2 would have come with a minus sign. Okay. Okay, good. So with this, we see that the, the propagators, any of the propagators in this entire diagram, okay, has the following structure that it, it is a sum of um, loop momentum loop momenta and uh, uh, external momenta with some uh, they appear with some coefficients okay where for example here that coefficient is minus one and all others have appeared as plus one but as I said if L2 was going um, uh, upwards if I had done a different assignment L2 going upwards then here would you would have got minus L2 okay so each of the propagator has the following structure. So it is um, It is some alpha, okay, I, L, I. So you have to sum over the number of uh, loops. So in this case, you, this is alpha 1, L1 plus alpha 2, L2. Okay, maybe I should make it explicit. Later I will drop this summation, but here I will put. So I is equal to 1, 2, 2 for this case. Plus, Here you have three external momenta. Okay, so you have beta one p one plus beta two p two plus beta three p three, where alpha i takes values one, zero or minus one. Okay, a particular propagator may have uh, may may not have any of the external momenta flowing through it. For example, here in this one. Okay there is no P1 or P2 and in this one there is no P1 or P2. Okay. Similarly, it's possible that um, some, some line does not have some of the external momenta flowing through it. So these are the values that is alpha and beta will take. I can be a little bit more careful and put J here. Okay, so that's the structure. That's what flows in the uh, in the propagators. Okay, so now what I'll do is I will look at a, a general L loop um, Green's function, and that will have, of course, an L loop Feynman diagram, and write down what the expression of that integral would be. Okay, so let's. Mm, 
here itself. So consider a L loop Feynman diagram. Okay, so and it has n propagator lines. So let's say it has n propagator lines and there are e external momenta. Okay. For the above diagram you have uh, for the above diagram you have l is equal to 2 n is equal to how much 1 2 3 4 5 6 and e is equal to 3 okay so let's write, write down uh, expression of uh, a general Feynman diagram okay so I will denote the Feynman diagram by F it will depend on these external momenta P1 P2 and so and so forth to P E then it will depend on all the masses but let's say all the masses are equal it doesn't change the arguments so they are all equal to you m square okay now as you know that these Feynman integrals are Lorentz invariant objects so they will not depend on p1 p2 separately but only on Lorentz invariant combinations and there are several Lorentz invariant combinations that you can make so of course you have given this you can make p1 dot p1 then you can make p1 dot p2 p1 dot p3 and so forth okay P e. okay. So it will depend on uh, these combination, these these Lorentz invariant quantities. Okay, it will not depend on p1 mu separately, but on either on p1. I mean, it 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 will depend on p1 square and p1 dot p2 and so forth. And of course, similar other combinations. So in general, it will depend on pi dot pj, where i and j both take values from one to e. Okay, and also on m square. And if your momenta are on shell, then P1 square is itself M square. So that's the, that's the dependence that we have. But remember that not all these will be independent because you have energy momentum conservation constraint. So not all these invariants are independent of each other. But I'll not worry about making them, making uh, or writing down the arguments with only independent ones I will just leave it like this okay, without any without any harm so it is really Feynman diagram will have this structure it will depend this dependence okay I'm going to denote these L loops loop momenta by L1 L2 L capital L so and also I want to work in n dimensions just like I previously worked in two dimensions because it was the integral was divergent in four I want to write expressions in n dimensions and of course this integral will be divergent in ultraviolet but I will pretend as if this problem doesn't bother us and later we will see that the reason why we can ignore that problem is because we can do renormalization. But for now we just uh, uh, pretend that that is a problem which is not going to disturb us. Okay. Later we will see that we can uh, remove these singularities and then uh, this analysis that I am going doing now goes through after you have done uh, those subtraction of uh, singularities. Okay, so I'm going to just write down expressions in general in n dimensions. Okay, so like, let's take a particular loop momentum Li. So D and Li, that is what we'll enter into the integral. 
and I'm going to write it as DLI0 DL sorry there's a time component and now I have spatial components and there are n minus 1 spatial components Li so if you are n is 4 then you have d4 Li that's DL0 d cube Li okay so 4 minus 1 is 3 and in general n minus 1 okay good so how about the first propagator let's call one of the propagators as propagator number 1 then another one is propagator number 2 and so forth up to propagator number um, what did I use for n propagators propagator number n so let's write propagator 1 whichever you have assigned as 1 so I am again not keeping whatever comes in the numerators so although I am doing scalar theory right now but because I am not bothered about the numerators this analysis will go through even for even for uh, other theories like QED and other theories okay where you have fermions and other gauge fields so this analysis is not uh, restricted to only scalar theories okay so propagator number not one I'm, let's take it in general propagator number um, yeah sorry I want to keep it one propagator number one so you have um, alpha i like I had previously written l i okay so these are all the uh, uh, loop momenta flowing through the propagator then you have beta j p j these are all the loop momenta that are flowing through the propagator but then I should put a label one to remind me that this is for first propagator square it minus m square and this is our i epsilon coming from i epsilon prescription okay and I have dropped the summation so summation convention is now implied so alpha i l i um, is basically alpha i l i where i runs from 1 to the number of loop momenta which is l and similarly beta j p j beta j beta 1 j p j uh, is j equal to 1 to the total number of external momenta right because we are adding this sum here contains a, a e number of terms so beta j 1 p j okay that's one of the propagators and similarly you will write for other propagators so propagator number m will have same thing but only this index 1 will get replaced by m so alpha i m l i plus beta j m p j square minus m square plus i epsilon okay good so um, now let me write down the expression which will be um, just writing dnli okay uh, for so dnl1 dnl2 so forth and each each time you divide by 2 pi to the n so i will always divide by 2 pi to the n in four dimension that division is 1 over 2 pi to the 4 and here it will be 1 over 2 pi to the n okay so we have to just do that integral does it help in writing okay maybe I'll I'll write it this entire integral again 
it's a little wastage of time, but I think it will make reading things easier. So f pi dot pj m square is d um, n l 1 over 2 pi to the n and these integral limits run from minus infinity to plus infinity and then you have uh, d n l um, total number l okay that's the loop number of loops 2 pi to the n okay and what do you integrate over is these propagators one over alpha i one l i plus beta j one p j square minus m square plus i epsilon this is the integral that we have Total number of propagators is n, so that's why this is index n, okay, plus beta j n p j whole square minus m square plus epsilon. So that's the integral which we want to uh, study. Okay, and these alphas and betas take values. 0 plus 1 and minus 1 okay now we will use our old technique of using Feynman parameters to combine these uh, denominators okay so um, let me go to the next page and I'll come back to this one again here Feynman parameters So I need to use a formula that is generalization of the formula that I have shown you earlier. Let me go back and see where it is. Yeah, here. So here we had 1 over a1, 1 over a2 as integral over dx with these factors, okay? Where 2 is the, this 2 comes, this 2 is coming because you have two functions, a1 and a2, okay? So I'm going to write a generalization of this formula when you have uh, several several such functions a1, a2 and an and the result is the following so this is just multiplication 1 over a1 times 1 over a2 so and so forth times 1 over an this is integral 0 to 1 okay so integral 0 to 1 dx1 so that's x1 is one of the Feynman parameters and actually there are n of them dx um, n this this n is this n this is not the number of dimensions okay this is I'm writing for if you have n factors um, 0 to n 1 and then you have a delta function that constrains these x1, x2 values. So it says x1 plus x2 plus so and so forth plus xn minus 1. Meaning this delta function hits only when the sum of all these Feynman parameters is equal to 1. Okay, not otherwise. And then the integrand is this. So these all these denominators a1, a2 and a3 up to an they nicely combine and they give you x1 a1 plus x2 a2 plus x n a n and the power is n okay and here we have a prefactor which is gamma n so gamma n is our familiar gamma function Okay, and you know that 
gamma n is equal to n minus 1 factorial if n is integer but gamma n is also defined for non-integral values okay you have gamma n defined for complex values as well so this is the Feynman parameterization and this is uh, what I'm going to use in manipulating the the function here the, the integral here okay so using this I can now write down this expression as gamma n so I'm including this first I'm putting the Feynman parameter integrals dx1 dx n okay, so there's the delta function then you have integrals over loop momenta Okay, and this run from minus infinity to plus infinity and then you have um, all these denominators have been combined so you have um, x1 alpha i 1 l i plus beta j beta 1 j plus p j okay, that whole squared minus m square plus epsilon so this is the contribution from the first propagator and this gets multiplied with x1 okay and then you have the remaining ones and the last one gets multiplied with x n because we have uh, n n such denominators, capital N denominators because we have capital N propagators. Okay, so for each Feynman uh, for each Feynman propagator, we have introduced one Feynman parameter. Okay, that's what we have done. So alpha i n l i plus beta j n p j okay, square this entire thing square minus m square plus epsilon okay and then this thing raised to the power n because we have n number of propagators okay Okay, so this is what we have to now analyze. So let me first look at this term. We have x1 multiplying minus m square. Then you have, next term will have x2 multiplying, okay, x1 multiplying minus m square plus epsilon. Then you have x2 multiplying minus m square plus epsilon. And the last one is xn multiplying minus m square plus epsilon. So that is easy to uh, deal with so x um, so what you get is minus m square plus i epsilon times x1 plus x2 so and so forth plus x n okay but then the delta function here that you have says that the sum has to be equal to 1 if it is not equal to 1, then the integral is 0, right? It doesn't hit. So that condition has to be satisfied. So I can use already use that condition here and put the, the sum to be 1, okay? Or, or let me make it more uh, explicit. This is equal to minus m square plus i epsilon times... Okay, um, 
Yeah. See, th this is in the denominator and it doesn't come like a product like this. But uh, it is because of this delta function that I should put this equal to 1. So you cannot use it directly and put it there, but I hope you understand this argument. Um, okay, so then I will just replace um, as far as this minus m square plus epsilon from each term is concerned, I will just have an, uh, th this thing will just sit outside of all these alpha li plus beta j lj terms. Okay. Okay, so that one part is done. And um, now I'll write this again. But this time I will also write explicitly the uh, integral over time components of the loop momenta. Okay, I will make that explicit. So I'm not doing much. I'm just carefully writing everything again. So this Feynman integral is now um, gamma n n then um, dl one zeroth component of it dl one the remaining and minus one components I just write here and then so this these limits are for all the variables okay not just for the zeroth component so dl zero l d l l and minus one okay this small n is for the dimensions uh, in which we are working times okay let's write it carefully Okay, let's see. So we have, first I will write down the, the time components. Or even better, just a second. doesn't matter how I write it. So you have x1 alpha i1 li0 beta j1 p j0. So that's the time component and that has to be squared. Okay, so this is um, this one. So I have just written the time component part of this, right? So if, if you take this entire thing as Q square, then I have written Q zero square. And I should now write down minus Q vector square. Okay, that's what I'm doing. So minus, this is in the denominator. Okay, so this minus this square is what um, um, makes up the first term in this in this denominator. 
okay and minus m square plus epsilon i am going to write at the end then you have um, okay let's keep it a little bit space x n alpha i n l i 0 correct plus beta n j p j 0 that squared okay and i should have similarly here the the space the square of the space component which is alpha i n l i plus beta j n p j squared okay and then you have minus m square plus I epsilon and this entire thing should be raised to the power n okay so that's what we have for this integral and i should see whether i can repeat the same uh, line of reasoning which i had earlier uh, for the case of one loop okay i will now just copy this entire expression let's see if i can toolbar yes there is another way um take this and duplicate okay good so um that's the that's the fundamental integral which i want to um uh, evaluate and uh, look at its analytic structure i'm not going to evaluate it actually uh, so now let's take this integral and Uh, modify it slightly so i will define a new fun new function new integral which i call f tilde okay so this is different from f let's see yeah f tilde where uh, the difference is the following so this f tilde i define by replacing the following i make the following replacements in f So what do I do? I say l one zero. Okay, this I define as e to the i theta l one n. Okay, this n is referring to the number of dimensions. Okay, this is. Let's go back. Here you remember I had e to the uh, sorry k to the zero is i times k two. and this two is for the number of dimensions right k0 k1 then k0 i label as k2 times this factor so i go to a two dimensional space k0 and k okay similarly because i am in n dimensions so i have these space components as k1 k2 up to k n minus 1 the zeroth component i am redefining using k n okay so that is the notation good and not only for loop momentum i'll do the same thing for um for so this is for all of all the loop momenta so i'll put an index i and the same thing i will do for all the external momenta so if i take momentum pi 0 Zeroth component of pi, then I define pi n to be uh, by this relation. Okay, so if I do that, and also uh, before that, I should I restrict theta between zero and pi by two. Okay, I think now I've said everything that I should. Good. So theta from zero to pi by two. so here uh, 
this is fine this dn this dl0 dl10 will become dl1 yeah there is no gain in copying this i have to unfortunately rewrite it or maybe i will not okay maybe i'll not i'm, I'm a little tired of writing this over and over again so dl0 i should replace by e to the i theta li n okay and similarly here and then what are the other places here li0 here li0 they get replaced and in this um, something i have yeah in this pj zeros okay so if you look at the first line here this entire thing gets modified right because it picks up a factor of e to the 2i theta right because each each uh, term here is is multiplied by e to the i theta square which is e to the i 2 theta so everyone is multiplied by e to the i 2 theta so that's the factor it picks up and uh, nothing happens to these and there is some factor of e to the i theta coming from each of these here okay so let's look at the denominator only the denominator so denominator what's the structure structure is um i will drop these labels i will this one one here and n and here i will just suppress it because it will be easier to write that way so the denominator is summation over all those indices that i am suppressing i am not showing here and it is x alpha i l um i 0 plus beta j pj 0 squared minus x alpha i l i plus beta j pj squared and then also have minus m square plus i epsilon correct just the denominator and you understand the sum is over these suppressed indices i will good and this is the denominator of um f and denominator of f tilde is what is summation x alpha i okay now this becomes yeah alpha i l i n plus beta j p j n squared minus no times um cos 2 theta plus i sin 2 theta okay this is the factor e to the i 2 theta and then you have minus okay that's what we have good so now let's take theta to be pi by 2 and see what happens so if theta is pi by 2 this is this is e to the i pi okay and this is um yeah so e to the i pi and e to the i pi is minus 1 okay now when this factor becomes minus 1 okay here it is anyway square of all real numbers see l i n they are all real so l i n they are real okay so if l i n are real the square is going to be a positive number this gives provides you with a minus 1 okay so this is minus of some positive number this is similarly here 
minus of some positive number then you have minus m square so that's again a negative number so this denominator other than the psi epsilon is a positive uh, it's a negative definite number okay or if you take out minus i overall it's a positive definite quantity it has a definite sign it doesn't change somewhere and it because it's uh, negative definite it never goes to zero right here i should put a n that is the denominator so this denominator never vanishes okay so it is well defined for theta equal to um uh, theta equal to pi by 2 okay this is what is wick rotation so let me write it down so we have a the denominator is a negative definite quantity is minus 1 power n times a positive definite okay because i have pulled out minus 1 minus 1 power n positive definite okay and then i don't need i epsilon right because if it never if it this denominator never becomes zero then you don't have to have an i epsilon okay it doesn't become zero when on the li n axis so i will drop that i epsilon so this is well defined because there are no poles on on ln integration contour okay and i have also included this minus m square in the argument right because that just adds up so um uh, this integral now can only be a function of um okay so let me show note that this integral can only be a function of so i, I earlier told you that it is a function of pi dot pj i am taking theta equal to pi by 2 now and arguing about f tilde for theta equal to pi by 2 so this is i p i n dot i p j n this i is complex uh, i okay minus p i dot p j okay p i and p j are the ex external momenta i is external momenta j j is external momenta so that's what p i dot p j is and i square is minus 1 so minus summation over whatever let me let me write explicitly so p i n p j n minus p i 1 p j 1 p i 2 p j 2 up to P i n minus one, P j n minus one. Right? Sorry, I made a mistake. I should have a plus because I have pulled out a minus sign. Okay, which is what you write as P i dot P j n. So you see that this this dot product now. this uh that enters into the function f tilde doesn't uh, have the dot products are not minkowskian right they the signature is now not minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 so forth or or plus minus minus so here the signature is euclidean right so you don't have pi is 0 pj is 0 minus something all all the terms are added together so it's this is what you have uh, in euclidean space so the signature is plus 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 up to n times okay so this is what is usually defined as the euclidean greens function 
So that is F tilde with this pi dot pj m square and if you put theta equal to pi by 2 then this is what is called as Euclidean uh, Feynman integral pi dot pj you have to evaluate it with this signature so I will make it explicit by putting Euclidean here and then you have m square and because these Feynman integrals enter the green functions correspondingly the green function will be given by this so this is the expression for the Green's function. Okay, this is called Euclidean Green's function. Okay, good, but uh, we still have to do a little bit more work to uh, say something about our original function. So now let's uh, look at what happens when theta is between 0 and pi by 2. Okay, when theta is between 0 and pi by 2, um, here, so when theta is between 0 and pi by 2, okay, I want to look at the imaginary part of the, of the denominator. And from where do I get those imaginary parts? So these are all, all real objects. Okay, M square is real. There is one part coming from I epsilon and another coming from this I sine 2 theta term. Okay, that is what gives you the imaginary part. Now sine 2 theta will be positive when theta is from uh, ranges in the region 0 to pi by 2. So that's positive. Okay, this overall a coefficient which multiplies this is also positive okay so the imaginary part and here also I, epsilon is positive okay so here the imaginary part is positive definite okay so which means that the there are no singularities in the integrand in this region okay because that is positive definite when this the denominator, the many part of the positive of the denominator is positive definite. Okay. So it means that there are no singularities in the integrand in this region. Okay. you are integrating over all the real values right your the integral uh, has all this this um, yeah here so when you are integrating this denominator you are integrating over lin uh, which takes real values okay so because there is a imaginary component which is negative which is uh, which is positive definite you are the denominator the uh, it, it never becomes zero on the on the axis of on the contour on the integration contour right so it never becomes zero so there are no singularities and um, and now your integral integrand is an analytic function okay, there are no singularities and when you integrate such a function, such an integrand, you what you get is again an analytic function. Okay, so what does that mean? How does that help? Yeah, before that, I will tell you how it helps, but before that, um, pay attention to the fact, to the i epsilon here, okay? It, if 
it ha so happened that the imaginary part coming from here, okay, coming from this term, or precisely from this multiplying this, came out to be negative, okay, instead of positive as we have got, then it could cancel this i epsilon term, right? Because you get minus i times some some quantity, and for some values of uh, these other other variables, that equals whatever i epsilon you have chosen. So there will be a zero. Um, there will be a zero sitting. There will be a pole that you will have in the in, in the function. So it will not be an analytic function, and integrating it will not give you another analytic function. So here uh, we have seen that the way we are rotating the contour, okay, in this in this manner, from zero to pi by two, we do not have any uh, singularities that appear. So what is the upshot? The upshot is that our g tilde or f tilde is same as um, what was here m square and then we had a theta is same as g tilde with sorry not th zero if you put zero then it is same as g p i p j m square okay so that's the same Green's function in for this value of theta and this is this is what we want to uh, understand right whether this is well defined object or not so as far as g tilde is concerned g tilde is same as g when theta equal to 0 then g tilde um, is an analytic function for in this range okay so g tilde is analytic in this this entire range and also g tilde is well defined when we have um, taken theta equal to pi by 2 okay that is the weak rotated greens function so that weak rotated greens function exists because we saw that there are no no poles on the contour okay and then g tilde then it it says that what it means is that the g tilde provides the analytic continuation of the weak rotated uh, greens function and then we can continue this uh, this g tilde on the on the uh, for theta equal to pi by 2 which is well defined to g tilde here okay because this is an analytic function i can I can get a analytic continuation for that. Okay, so this um, with this we have argued that these objects are are well defined. We can compute them and also find their analytic structure by um, by using this continuation from this weak rotated Green's function to the Green's function with physical momenta. Right here, the momenta are not physical, okay, because we have taken space-like um, space-like momenta, and which which we saw here. Where was that? Yeah, here you see that pi dot pj, which is what enters in the Green's function. This is positive, okay, because this is in Euclidean and there's a minus sign. So you see all these. All these uh, dot products are negative. All the momenta pi square they all become negative. So th that's why I'm saying that they are um, space-like. So you can go from this Green's function defined for sp uh, space-like momenta and all space-like dot products to Green's function, which is defined for physical momenta in which you are interested in when you, when you are looking at scattering processes. Right, because when you look at scattering processes, the external momenta are on shell and they are they are physical momenta. So this uh, proves that we can finally do analytic continuation and everything is well defined. Okay, we will continue further in the next video.